the second topic of today's session. I'm again Vinay Prasad. I'm a hematologist and oncologist and associate professor at the University of California, San Francisco. This talk is entitled Super Responders in the Broader Landscape of Precision Oncology. Thank you again, ACR, for having me. In terms of conflicts of interest, they haven't changed from the first talk. I'm still the author of Malignant, How Bad Policy and Bad Evidence Harm People with Cancer. Additional conflicts that I discussed before are research funding from Arnold Ventures, royalties from Johns Hopkins Press and Medscape. I've given grand rounds and lectures at universities, nonprofits, and professional societies for modest honoraria. I'm a consultant for United Healthcare, and I've spoke for Evacor. Plenary session, my podcast has Patreon backers. Landscape of Oncology. You know, by the end of this talk, I hope to connect why thinking about the broader landscape of precision oncology is deeply important to think clearly about exceptional and super responders. And I hope to, by the end of this talk, circle back to something called a Fermi estimate, named after the famous mathematician Enrico Fermi, and explain why that's important to make sense of super responders. So, again, my picture is in the way, so I'm going to move that out of the way. Imagine every single person in 2019 who will die of cancer in America. How many of these patients would be eligible for the classes of medications that are the stock and trade of what we do? How many people are going to be eligible for cytotoxic drugs? How many people immunotherapy drugs like the PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor drugs? And how many genome-targeted therapies where you run a molecular test, you find out the person has an alkyl rearrangement, and you prescribe seritinib, for instance? In work that's forthcoming by Eddie Maldonado, Scott Parsons, and myself, we estimate the proportion of U.S. cancer patients who may benefit from cytotoxic chemotherapy. So over on the left, we show you all the patients in America presenting with advanced cancer who's eligible, pardon the typo, for cytotoxic chemotherapy drugs. And the answer is 81%. Among these eligible patients, what percent of people will have a response? It's about 32%, and the breakdown is shown here on the right, in the rightmost column. But the key point here is that 80% of patients we see in our clinic with advanced or metastatic disease are likely going to get at least one or more cytotoxic chemotherapy drugs. They remain the backbone of our therapies. Here, work that I performed with Allison Haslam from Oklahoma University. This is the estimation of the percent of U.S. patients with cancer who are eligible for and respond to checkpoint inhibitor drugs, the very popular class of medications. This was published in JAMA Network Open. Allison finds that eligible patients include about 43% of all Americans presenting with advanced or metastatic cancer in 2020. And this is the rough breakdown. Of course, the biggest component here, the biggest driver of the share of people who are eligible for these drugs is non-small cell lung cancer. Now let's think about what we hear about genome-driven oncology because genome-driven oncology and super responders are oh so wedded. We hear things like we will no longer use histology to define cancers, we will use mutations. We hear that someday in the near future every individual patient will be eligible for one or a combination of targeted drugs. We hear that we are accelerating science. We're seeing exponential growth in genome-targeted drugs, and we're reaching an inflection point in precision oncology. We see images like this. This comes from the MD Anderson. We're going to take a lot of people. They're all going to get molecular profiling. They're all going to be paired with drugs, not based on the tissue of origin, but based on the molecular characteristics of their tumor. And they're all going to do exceptionally well. This is the promise of precision oncology. Well, John Markart, Emerson Chen, and I published in JAMA Oncology a 2018 estimation of the percentage of U.S. patients with cancer who are eligible for and who have response to genome-driven oncology. Here I'm just showing you the eligible fraction, and it is roughly 8.3% in that year we performed this study, which was 2018. And this is the breakdown. And here again, lung cancer is the big player here. Erlotinib, efatinib, gefitinib, and afzimertinib account for the largest individual share, EGFR and non-small cell lung cancer, of all patients who are benefiting from genome-driven strategies. And this is, of course, based on FDA-approved drugs at that time. We also took the additional step of running this analysis year over year. So here we're plotting you in the blue line, the percentage of U.S. cancer patients eligible for these drugs, and in the orange line, the cumulative percent of responders for these drugs. And I think what's notable here is that it is roughly 
a year-over-year -year consistent slope, about half a percent to a percent per year rise. Um, that certainly is good. That's progress. But that's not the kind of progress that might be consistent with some of the rhetoric in this space. If you superimpose checkpoint inhibitors, you get a graph that looks like this. Checkpoint inhibitors were unheard of prior to 2011 with the approval of the ipilimumab. Um, the big boost here you see in, um, in the checkpoint inhibitor curves comes from non-small cell lung cancer and the PD-1 class of antibodies. And now you see a blue curve that's reaching, you know, nearly half of all U.S. cancer patients, but the orange curve, the cumulative percent of responders, that seems to be plateauing. It's something between 15 to 20 percent of patients. And I think that that might be the case, that we might be seeing a plateau in terms of the number of people who are with cancer who are going to respond to these drugs, and future studies will actually, if anything, bring that blue line and that orange line closer together in time as we more appropriately tailor our therapies. And cytotoxic drugs really look off the charts when you plot them this way. Um, the cumulative percent of people who are eligible for these medications is far higher than both these other popular classes of medications, and the cumulative percentage of responders is more than the sum of the other two domains put together. Here I've done something that might be provocative. I've superimposed the gains in genome-driven cancer medicine with the cost of genome sequencing, particularly whole genome sequencing over time. Now, one thing to note here is the green, the green curve that shows you the reduction in price of genome sequencing, that's on the log axis. So we're seeing a precipitous log fold reduction in the cost of sequencing, and that does not yet appear to be met with commensurate increases in the number of druggable genome targets. So if the belief was it was merely a matter of genomic knowledge that would unlock the potential for genome-driven cancer medicine, I believe that we're not seeing the fruits of that hypothesis, that there is a discordance between sequencing and the result of genome-driven cancer medicine. It's important to remember that even for FDA-approved indications, targeted genome-driven cancer drugs are not cures. Here, we've looked at the median of the summed median duration of responses, and that's about 30 months, suggesting that drug resistance is almost universal in this space, um, and that these drugs, although they are laudable advances, are not cures for the majority of patients with advanced or metastatic cancer. Here is something that I found very provocative a couple years ago. This was a paper published by Memorial Sloan Kettering Investigators looking at a cohort of patients with non-small cell lung cancer getting chemotherapy with pemetrexid. And here they're plotting the progression-free survival probability based on different genomic alterations. Of course, RAS, a notorious genomic alteration, is shown in blue with a poor median progression-free survival. ROS1 is shown in yellow or orange with a pretty good median progression-free survival. What's notable here is that all patients here are receiving the same medication, which is pemetrexid, and so you see a marked disparate um, outcomes based on genomic information when everyone is getting a cytotoxic drug. Of course, we have approvals for ROS1 non-small cell lung cancer, specifically crizotinib, and it was FDA approved on the basis of this uncontrolled investigation that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and here I'm plotting the progression-free survival from that study. Now, what happens if we were to do something that is taboo, the cross-trial comparison? What if we compared the Drillin data and Pemetrexid with the registration data for crizotinib? Here I've superimposed the two curves on the same time axis, and I've shown blue arrows to show you where Pemetrexid did and where Crizotinib does in the same cohort, ROS1. Of course, we don't have and we will never have a controlled clinical trial that tests chemotherapy against targeted therapies for ROS1 alteration non-small cell lung cancer. And this is a cross-trial comparison, which is forbidden and taboo. But I want to be real clear about what is forbidden about a cross-trial comparison. A cross-trial comparison cannot tell you which one of these two agents would be the winner. That's what's forbidden. You can't, at that level of detail, figure out which is the better drug. But a cross-trial comparison can tell you something that is provocative, which is, are these roughly in the same ballpark? Is crizotinib a transformative drug and the outcomes are so much better? Is it a parachute drug? It's so much better than what would have happened with Pemetrexid that we could never do a randomized trial. And I think what this shows you is, rather provocatively, that it is not in a different ballpark. It's in the same ballpark, 
Could it be better than Pemetrexid? Absolutely. Could it be even on par with Pemetrexid? I think that's a possibility that is raised by this cross-trial comparison that we just don't know. And I think what it shows you is that there might be much more equipoise here than many are willing to grant. So Ross 1, I think we do have equipoise to perform the randomized control trial that has never been and likely will never be done, which is crizotinib versus chemotherapy. Looking at things like progression-free survival, survival and quality of life, particularly with different sequences of these agents. Now let's talk a little bit about basket trials before we connect this back to super responders. Basket trials are an emerging branch of medical oncology where we seek to test whether or not drugs work in tumors irrespective of the tissue of origin. For instance, if you have a TREC fusion, um, you might benefit from larotrectinib. If you have a BRAF V600 mutation, Vemurafim may be the drug for you. Whether or not you have metastatic melanoma or whether or not you have cholangiocarcinoma, that might be the right drug for you. And basket trials explore that hypothesis of typically what is the response rate in diverse tumor types with the same molecular aberration. This is the result of larotrectinib. On the top, I've shown you a screenshot of the New England Journal paper. On the bottom, I showed you the very first Google image that popped up when I searched for this drug, um, which is the waterfall plot. And that is a spectacular waterfall plot. Many of the bars are lower than minus 30, which is the typical resist 1.1 cutoff. Now, a shout out to Sunny Kim, who did a study that appeared in JAMA Network Open that shows that waterfall plots consistently exaggerate the response rate by roughly 11 to 12 percentage points. And they do so because they omit patients who are not able to be assessed. And they also show you the single best scan and they don't use resist 1.1 confirmatory scans. And for those two reasons, they tend to exaggerate response, and that's worth noting. But even with that caveat, this is still an impressive result. But the graphic before says that larotrectinib is efficacious regardless of tumor type. But when you read the publication, you find that tumor type seems to have something to do with something. The most common tumor type that is noted here is salivary gland tumor at 22%. Other soft tissue sarcoma is roughly one in five. Infantile fibrosarcoma, something that I must admit, I don't have a lot of clinical experience with, that's 13%. Thyroid cancers, which I do have more experience with, that's 9%. Colon cancers, 7%. Lung, 7%. Melanoma, 7%. Breast is down there at about 2%. Pancreas, 2%. So what's the point here? The point here is that this fusion kinase, which is clearly exquisitely important for oncogenesis and whose drugging is clearly beneficial, it doesn't appear to be equally distributed in tumor types irrespective of frequency. It appears to be very, very common in a subset of very, very rare cancers. What happens if you look broadly at basket trials in many, many different tumor types? And this is something that Antonius Hazim and I did a couple years ago. We looked very broadly at every single published basket trial in every single tumor type. And we found at this time, there was just a handful of studies, just a basket of baskets, if you will. And these were the targets that we looked at over on the left. This is a graph that we made in our pooled analysis of basket plot studies. And I'm gonna walk you through this because I think it is super important. On the x-axis on log scale, I'm showing you the incidence per 100,000 of that tumor type that's included in a basket study. And these are all tumor agnostic studies. So they could take any tumor type. They had to have the molecular aberration enter. On the y-axis, I'm showing you the pooled number of patients in the basket. Okay, so, you know, because one of these um, basket studies included BRCA mutations, ovarian cancer, of course, you know, it's, it's up there, it's on the chart. Um, um, but this is really the relationship between how common tissue types are in the real world, the x-axis and how common tissue type representation is in basket studies, the y-axis. And the red line is a one-to-one -one plot. And that's a key plot, because if the mutations that we are pursuing doggedly in basket studies occur at the same frequency with which tumors occur, the dots would regress to the red line. They would fall along the red line meaning that you have roughly as many colon cancer patients in your basket trials as you do in real world. You have roughly as many bladder cancers in the basket trials as in the real world. Um, the blue line is the regression line through the actual data points, and it has a shallower slope than the one-to-one -one line. So what does this mean? This means, are we including preferentially rare tumors in basket studies rather than more common cancers? And the answer is unequivocally, yes, we are. 
Basket studies are preferentially accruing rarer tumor types, and they might be doing that for one of two reasons. One, of course, patients with rarer tumor types may be more likely or more drawn to basket-level protocol studies. The other possibility is that oncogenic driver events that are so seductive and marvelous, such as larotrectinib, that lead to such sustained therapeutic responses, they may disproportionately be occurring in cancers that occur quite rarely, where those oncogene events are exquisitely important. For common cancers that are the sequela of a complex interaction of genetics and environment that are ubiquitous in our daily life, those single oncogenic driver events might be few and far between, and thus we might not make the requisite and necessary steps to bend the cancer curve by merely focusing on rare oncogenic driver events. That's a hypothesis that will take many decades to further elucidate and understand, but these data, at a minimum, um, should be provocative and food for thought. Of course, we also looked across all these tumor types at the percentage of people in basket trials who are responders or non-responders. Responders are shown in blue. Orange shows you the non-responders. And I think what's notable here is that you know, response rate across all these studies is not bad at 21.7%, but the glass is more than half empty. It's 80% empty, and that's the percentage of people who are not having a response to these targeted drugs. If you look back many decades ago to a paper by Chris Grady and colleagues that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, if you look at phase one clinical trials that were tested consecutively at the NCI CTEP, you find roughly a 16.5 to 27% response rate in those that contained a cytotoxic drug. So these are phase one trials from a few decades ago in people who've exhausted typically proven therapeutic options, and this is the kind of response rate you get. And my point here is just to say that you can't compare cross-trial, this study, to, um, to the pool basket study, but you can say that they are roughly the same ballpark, and so there may be more equipoise here than we typically give credit to. Uh, the last point here is bringing this together for what it has to do with super responders and exceptional responders. I think it has a great deal to do with understanding that set of data. Um, and one way in which we can kind of bridge the two is to think about something called the Fermi estimate. So roughly from a number of analyses that we did a couple years ago, as of 2018, we had roughly 100,000 to 200,000 people who had undergone gene sequencing with metastatic cancer through MSKCC Impact Project, Genie, and Foundation Medicine. The Fermi estimate is a mathematical way to estimate something that's typically unknowable or very difficult. So for instance, if I asked you what was the population density of Los Angeles, you would be baffled. You, unless you knew off the top of your head, in which case you'd be a savant, you wouldn't be able to tell me what that was. But Fermi had a way to estimate that. He said, you know, let's round everything to the nearest 10 to the power of. So what's the population of Los Angeles? Is it closer to 1 million, 10 million, or 100 million? Say maybe 10 million. What's the size of the city? Is it closer to 100 square miles or 10 by 10? 1,000 uh, square miles or 30 by 30? Or 10,000 square miles, 100 by 100? And you might say maybe it's roughly 30, It's roughly 1,000 square miles, 30 by 30, the Los Angeles metropolitan area, and maybe 10 million people live in that area. And Enrico Fermi would just put everything to the nearest 10 to the power of. He'd say 10 to the power of 7, there's 10 to the power of 3 uh, square miles, and he would just divide 10 to the power of 7 by 10 to the power of 3, which is 10 to the power of 4, or 10,000 people per square mile. And it turns out the actual number is not too far from that. It's 8K. So this is a very quick, quick dirty way to estimate uh, a complex phenomenon. Let's apply it to super responders. So we have found in our reviews of the case literature that I talked about in the first talk, we were roughly 10 to the power of two cases we can find. Um, they've been roughly 10 to the power of five people sequenced. So I think what that means is that super responders are roughly 10 to the power of three. But 10 to the power of three times one in a thousand is really the rate at which we're seeing that. And if we're a little bit more stringent on the numerator, that might drop down another order of magnitude. So it might be one in 10,000. And I think the take home point here is that super responders are exceedingly rare. And they're in part rare because of the broader challenges in reconciling our understanding of the genome, which has been uh, leaps and bounds uh, over where it was 10 years ago, with the difficult and thorny problem uh, that cancer is uh, so often not due to single, on single oncogene driver events and is marvelously more complex and frustrating um, than we typically give it credit for. So I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. In terms of credit here, credit goes due um, to Eddie Maldonado, who is an OHSU chief now applying for HEMONC uh, fellowship. You're going to want this uh, gentleman in your program. Scott Parsons, who is now a HEMONC fellow in Scripps. Um, Allison Haslam, who's faculty at Oklahoma. John Markhart, who is a budding surgeon at Medical College of Wisconsin and Emerson Chen, um, right there, junior faculty at OHSU. 
And if you want to have further reading, I recommend you look behind my face at Malignant, How Bad Policy and Bad Evidence Harm People with Cancer, where I describe a lot more uh, along these lines that may interest you. So thank you so much.